Hello and welcome to Crops Talk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Another shot at forced regime change. That's what it looks like. As Syria continues to experience collapse, the neighborhood is not being spared. What was a tragic domestic civil war is now becoming a regional conflict. Again, the law of unintended consequences appears to be in play. To cross talk the Syrian civil war, I'm joined by Flint Leverett in Washington. He is a professor of international relations at Penn State University and co-author of the book, Going to Tehran, Why the United States Must Come to Terms with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Also in Washington, we have Matthew Feeney. He is an assistant editor at Reason 24-7. And in New York, we cross to Ed Hussein. He is a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. All right, gentlemen, cross talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want. Flint, um, Libya, Ex uh, imploded. Is Syria exploding and taking the neighborhood with it? Um, it, it the, the, the risks of that are, are certainly increasing. Um, I've been saying for, for it seems like two years now that the only way to stop the violence, to, to put a, a, a lid on this, is through diplomacy. Diplomacy aimed at a political settlement based on, on power sharing. Um, the UN envoy, the Arab League envoy, Mr. Brahimi, is a potentially capable, um, capable mediator for that kind of process. Um, he initially resisted pressure uh, to say that Assad had to go as uh, the beginning of uh, a political process, but he eventually succumbed to that pressure, and that's really reduced his potential effectiveness. Russia is trying to, uh, stepping up its efforts to, to promote a political process. The Syrian government is ready to take part. Um, other important players, Iran, China, are backing a political process. But unfortunately, uh, some of the supporters of the Syrian opposition, the United States, the Europeans, the Saudis, uh, seem determined uh, to, to intensify their uh, armed support, their, their uh, military support for the opposition, uh, that's going to make it very hard to get serious diplomacy going, and it's going to keep the violence rolling along. Ed, is it too late for diplomacy now? No, not at all. Uh, we should give diplomacy every chance for as long as possible, and I think under but, the current circumstances, but does the Syrian it's opposition that. want that, that? Simply because but does the Syrian opposition want diplomacy? M what? We have the evidence uh, to support the fact that Muaz al Khatib has gone out of his way, has upset his own rank and file mm -hmm. and his own followers to open negotiations with a butcherous regime in Damascus. There's no two ways about it that this is a regime that's killed its own people, maimed its own people. And despite the fact that the Syrian National Council and even the Free Syrian Army or elements within it and the Al Qaeda supporters inside the country that are, you know, hell-bent on destroying the regime, Muaz al-Khatib has gone out of his way and repeatedly offered in the last two months, with the U.S. support, I hasten to add, uh, an, an initiative that results in greater peace. What was Assad's response to that? Assad demolished, President Assad demolished Muaz al-Khatib's family home in Damascus the day after Muaz al-Khatib made the uh, uh, offer for diplomacy and peace talks. So I don't think it's just uh, the, the fault of the rebels here. I think there's, it's, it's important to realize that Bashar al-Assad and his supporters are not really in the business of peace because they've got everything to lose and the opposition has everything to gain. Okay, Matthew, does the opposition have peace in mind? They sound like a nasty lot to me, excuse me. Sure, well, um, I don't think all of them are a nasty lot and I think most of the opposition, uh, or, you know, a huge, uh, significant amount of them do want peace and want a, you know, a transition uh, that's, you know, going to be much less bloody than what it's been. Uh, my only concern with this uh, political line is uh, just as, Ed was saying, you know, there are al-Qaeda elements mm -hmm. to the opposition, and um, who's going to be speaking for them after yep. Assad is gone? It seems to me that whatever, it's going to be messy, whatever happens. Flint, what do you think about that? I mean, is there the, uh, you know, are we supporting the right people, meaning the West supporting the right people in Syria? Or do we know? Um, of, of course not. Of, of, of course not. Well, um, I mean, it's very, very clear. Uh, I mean, there's a long track record of uh, U.S. and Western support for armed groups seeking to overthrow their government, whether it's in Afghanistan, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in Libya or now in Syria. And every time we have done this, it, is, it is, has generated massive civilian carnage and has produced uh, serious blowback. 
um, oftentimes terrorist no, no, blowback sorry, sorry, against, uh, with respect, against U.S. With, 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 with respect, but we you're, just you're, you're, pretending, you're pretending as though there's Western armed support. There, there is no armed support for the Syrian opposition. That's why we're in the well, mess that we're in partly. Who's giving them the arms? Where are the arms coming from? Who's giving them the arms? Who's training no, them? I mean, just, no, just look at today's Times report. No, 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 no. I mean, they, they seek almost 500 tons of arms a week. What they're getting is about 40 tons of arms. And those arms they're buying themselves with money that's coming from them, from individual donors in the Gulf. There is no state support either from the US or from the European Union or from Turkey or from Saudi Arabia in the sense of supporting them in the way the Libyan opposition was supported. The opposition wants that the, support. The United I'm not saying States they should have that support. The United States is stepping up what it calls non-lethal aid the support. They don't the, support. and they're now getting involved in training. They're, the US is now getting involved in training. Yeah, um, that's, that, the, that's, the not, that's not arms support. Fight. That's not arms support and that's not weaponry. Okay, Matthew, jump no, that's in. Not weaponry, Matthew, that's not jump arms in. You, 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 you Matthew, help others give in. weapons I'm, I'm, to the rebels and then you train them to use them and that's not, uh, that's not arms support? That's, that's really semantic nonsense. No, the, fa the fact is they have no weapons from the West. Those well, are, it's, it's, you can't deny the facts. They're desperate for those weapons. They don't have those weapons. Matthew, go ahead. Sure. I mean, we, I think it's worth keeping in mind that uh, John Kerry said recently yes. that, uh, you know, the U.S. would not be providing direct military support because he is, uh, he and I, I assume uh, other American officials are concerned about where these weapons are going to end up. And, you know, the, and it, I think it's also worth keeping in mind that Obama has changed his mind on this before and that uh, Petraeus, Clinton, Panetta were all apparently urging the president to back, uh, you know, with military aid the Syrian opposition. And I think we can all, you know, be thankful that the president decided to not do that, even though it seems now that uh, aid is going to become a little more direct from the United States. Flint, is this a good but idea? If, but if the United States <laughs> is involved in helping others make decisions well, about to whom weapons will be given, and then the United States is involved in training rebel fighters in using those weapons, the United States is supporting an armed insurgency. Fair point, Ed. Do you agree or disagree with that? It's, uh, no, no, I think it's just, uh, it's, no, no, it's just, a, it's, a, just a, it's a black and white, very simple outlook. The fact is that the Syrian uprising was spontaneous. It was homegrown. It was native. It was not driven by the U.S. Syrian rebels came to the U.S. for support. And again, the fact is the U.S. thus far has provided humanitarian aid, non-lethal support, and gone and given food and blankets, has not given the kind of weapons that uh, Flint asserts and, uh, you know, uh, and poured fuel on a, on a conflict. The U.S. has tried repeatedly to rein in this conflict. The U.S. is not involved in the, in the kind of uh, um, uh, armed support that, that, that's being portrayed. We should be debating whether it should or shouldn't, but it, it seems to me that the fact that it's being portrayed that the U.S. is already, it's a done deal somehow, you know, that the U.S. is providing arms when it really isn't. I mean, there's it, it, no point repeating this fact over and over, and over again, that the, the rebels want arms from the U.S., the Turks, the, the Gulf um, allies the U.S. has, want the U.S. to support. And I say this on the basis of being in those countries on a regular basis, that, you know, the U.S. gets this flack again and again, that why aren't you supporting the Syrian um, opposition? And the U.S. isn't. That said, the Russians and the Iranians are actively supporting right. The regime, and there's an there's an imbalance there, and, and and it's worth addressing that imbalance rather than pretending that somehow the U.S. is involved in arming the opposition when it blatantly, nakedly is not. Matthew, you want to jump in? Right, but it. Well, I just want. I mean, I, I agree that perhaps you know the discussion should be you know um, if you know, whether aid should be increased, even though I, you know, I agree with Ed that I don't think the U.S. is providing direct military support to uh, Assad's opposition. Uh, that said, I don't actually think um, it's worth uh, you know, actually providing aid to the opposition uh, in that way, even with Iran and Russia's support for the Assad regime. But I don't know if Flint happens to agree with that or not. Okay, Flint, go ahead. Jump in. Look, I think I think you know we we may no, we I, may I argue about no, let's go how to, to Flint. Go ahead, go ahead. Various, let's go Flint. Let's say with Flint. Go ahead, Flint. We we may we may argue about how to parse and interpret various channels, various levels, various modes of U.S. support for the opposition. But I think it is simply incontrovertible that the United States is supporting the opposition and wants to see it succeed in the project of overthrowing the Assad government. And as long as that is the U.S. position and the U.S. is involved in whatever ways in supporting the opposition, 
the chances for getting a political process off the ground, which might actually produce a power sharing agreement and end this conflict, are, are negligible. And, and that's okay. really the only way out of no, this. I, I think the, the opposition uh, can't win. It's deadlock. Go ahead, Ed, jump in. Go ahead. Good point. No, the, the opposition. Can, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, uh, forgive me. I think the opposition can win if the opposition was given the level of support that it required, whether it's anti-tank weaponry or whether it's anti-aircraft weaponry. Those are the two key forms of weaponry that the opposition has repeatedly demanded you, and you not been given by the U.S. You think that the opposition could win in you the, make the sense that the it could, US, it could, it could if the, if take power from the Assad to, government for, and produce a coherent nationwide alternative. If I may, no, if, I, if I may... Now, forgive me if I may, if the U.S. wanted to remove Bashar al-Assad from power, it could do so within 24 hours. It has that level of military capability and superiority, and Assad knows it. The U.S.'s major concern, and I think the West's major concern, is what happens after Assad falls. And unless that question is answered, the U.S. is, I think, the Obama administration rightly thinking twice about forcefully removing Assad. It can be done at the drop of a hat, but it hasn't been done for the reasons that need to be outlined. In other words, the sectarianism Ed, Ed, inside Syria, the, the it... infighting among the opposition. Would you like to see the, into other would like to see the, the U.S. do that? Moving Assad. Would you like to see the U.S. do that in 24 hours? F uh, uh, no, it's not as simple as whether I would like well, it or not. You the just said is, it was it possible. Does it better Syria? Okay with the forceful removal you just said it was yes but no what's possible doesn't mean it's inevitable no possibility no, but it should not it be but should it be possibility means it should it be done the u.s has and has not exercised it should not be no, all right no, gentlemen i'm going to jump in here we're going to go to a short break and after that short break we'll continue our discussion on syria stay with our team Okay, and does force regime change ever work? Does it ever work out? I, I, I think the recent history of forced regime changes, if we're looking at Iraq as, as an important case study, the, the answer is that forced regimes don't work out. And I think that lesson has been learned, and that's why there's a reluctance and a wisdom and a prudence on the part of the West to forcefully remove Assad. It, it can be done, but it has not been done for the very reasons that, that, that Iraq showed us, that there are tensions, sectarian, uh, geographic, religious, economic, just, just class, like, Just like um, Syria. Uh, just ethnic, like Syria. That, that make well, it difficult for... You should probably for... be asking the... Well, absolutely, yeah, exactly like Syria. Well, you should probably be asking the people in uh, you should be asking the people in Mali if actually Iraq is the most recent or best example of forced regime change. Uh, the, what we did in Libya certainly spilled over into Mali, and the French are trying to be uh, French and other African and African forces are trying to deal with that. It's not as if uh, you know the that. Iraq was the last time that the U.S. Uh, intervened militarily, well, and Libya, you know, the results speak Libya. for themselves. Libya is a good example. Flint, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, I, I don't think forcible regime change works. And it, it doesn't matter whether it's done by massive and direct Western military intervention, invasion, and occupation, as in the case of Iraq, or if it's done you know, somewhat more standoffishly or indirectly by relying on local proxies and providing air support like we did in, in, in Libya, or if we're providing support for, for local proxies as we are in, in Syria. It, it doesn't work. It produces massive political carnage. It does not create stable political outcomes in its, in its aftermath. Ed, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I think in, in general that's acceptable, but there are exceptional circumstances in which we should not go down the route of forever ruling out uh, intervention in countries in which dictators are butchering their populations, if the population is homogenous, if there is a credible opposition in place, then intervention by the international community is necessary and warranted. And the UN with the R2P or the right to protect doctrine 
gives that uh, legal cover. But the most important point is the day after. And I think often we get the day after wrong, as we saw in, 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 the, in the several examples that came up, be it Libya, be it Iraq, be it elsewhere. And the problem with the UN's doctrine of right to protect is there is no commitment then on the part of the global powers of the international community to nation build afterwards and to ensure law and order. And there is great enthusiasm here in the West to remove and remove Bashar al-Assad, but there is, much like Iraq, no day after plan, no coherence among the opposition, and sectarian tensions flaring up, a region that's unstable. And for those very reasons, I think the West rightly thus far has not intervened in the way that it could do. Okay. Flint, who's driving this? Is it Saudi Arabia? Yeah, uh, well, the could, could you provide to an protect. example of a country that you think does meet these uh, qualities? Matthew, go ahead. Go ahead. Could, could, could you perhaps um, outline a country you think that does meet those criteria? Anyone? For intervention? Is there a country that you uh, would have. I mean, off the top of my head, I mean, and it, I mean, I can't sort of identify a country, but I mean, one that does come to my mind if, if you know, if the Iranian uh, dictatorship or the Iranian uh, clerics were to unleash mass violence in, on their population in the way that the, uh, the Syrians have. I think Iran's much more contained geographically than Syria is. Iran's population is much more homogenous well, than the population in Syria about, is. If there about, was violence, what about if there were protests at Saudi the level Arabia? that we're seeing in Syria, I think Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship. Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship. Uh, no, you, are, you asked for an example and, uh, you know, uh, on a theoretical level, but the reality on the ground is not that way inclined yet in Iran, and I think that's, that's an important example. Saudi Arabia is different. Saudi Arabia's economic assets, I, I think the idea global of energy Iran supplies, is a sectarian tensions, the majority ha, ha, supporting its population is absurd. Flint, jump in. No, 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 the point is, was, it, it no, 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 and that was the point. No, 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 you're going under no, 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 the no, 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 I want to go to Flint now. Go ahead, Flint. I mean, the, the, the idea that, that the West should consider intervening in, in Iran if, if it, quote unquote, cracks down on its population, that it's this, you know, hated dictatorship that doesn't have the majority support of the Iranian population is just absurd. There's absolutely no empirical data to support that proposition and vast amounts of empirical data, polling studies and others that would, that would say, say otherwise. The responsibility to protect doctrine does not supersede the basic stipulation of the UN Charter that countries can only use force in self-defense or when the Security Council has authorized it under a Chapter 7 resolution. Those are the requirements for the legitimate use of force. And the Security Council has not authorized it in Syria. It's not going to authorize it in Iran. And to try and use R2P, uh, Responsibility to Protect, as a justification for doing this without the Security Council authorization makes a travesty of any notion of international no, law or No, order. no, no, that wasn't my point. I think you missed, no, I think you fundamentally missed my point. The point is R2P on its own is not enough. R2P, without the commitment to nation build afterwards and without a commitment to put law and order in place, does not suffice for the purposes of protecting a population which is being butchered by a political force. That's the point. The point is not to use R2P and then you know, intervene and invade countries. I, I think you completely missed the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, Matthew, what's, who's driving this? Is it the Saudis, the, the Gulf countries? I mean, because what, there is no U.S. national interest in Syria. Well, no, they're, they're, uh, it doesn't seem like there is, except, you know, obviously the fear that uh, al-Qaeda could gain a bit of a foothold there. I mean, it, it seems amazing to me that, you know, the, the, the government's job is, well, in part to protect its nat national interests and to declare war when appropriate. And I, I, I have yet to hear any American politician seriously or any well-known one say, look, why don't we have a declaration of war against the Assad regime and go in, defeat him and, you know, get out. But I, I, as Ed's saying, you know, there's this uh, tendency to want to nation build afterwards. And in, the, in Syria, it just seems like that would not be possible given the current situation. Lynch, what, if Assad left today, what would happen in Syria? Anything different? You know, I, I, I think well, I mean, that no the one idea can that, actually that, that predict no, it's what a hypothetical, fall that It's a fall, hypothetical, right? hypothetical. Flint, go ahead. I think, you know, the idea that the opposition is going to form some coherent nationwide government in Syria is, is a delusion. You know, if, if Assad left or if, you know, he surrendered Damascus, you would still have 
um, you know, tens of thousands of, of men under arms supporting the Syrian government, who would be, you know, controlling uh, various parts of Syria. Among the opposition, you would have various regional, basically, warlords mm -hmm. emerge, controlling okay. different parts of Syria. It would be it would be chaos. It would be an incredibly sustained, violent situation. I also want to say on the point about U.S. motivation. You're describing for this, the current situation. The U.S. started You're describing the current Syrian situation. opposition okay, let me, as a as way as well. of no, trying to push changed. back against Iran. Okay, that's what I was getting at. Ed, go ahead, jump in. No, I, the, the description that Flint provides is the perfect description of what we're seeing at the moment. Two sides at loggerheads, logger complete chaos in the country, uh, unwarranted and unlimited bloodshed uh, across Syria. And I think Flint is right that the real issue here is Iran, and the real issue here is to... Well, that's what it's all about. It's Iran. not about the Syrian people. Uh, it's not about perceive, democracy. Perceivably, perceivably. It's about Iran. It's about Iran. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. It, 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 it started off... And it continues to be about Iran for those of us outside of the country, but I think inside the country, for 20 million plus Syrians, it's not about Iran, and it's about their freedoms. It's about them being butchered by Bashar al-Assad, and it's about the, the interference in their country now by Saudi Assad Arabia, government. by Turkey, by Qatar, by Russia, by Iran, by Hezbollah. Those are the difficulties inside Syria, and that's the reason why Muaz al-Khatib wants to go via Russia the U.S. and Turkey to try and negotiate a settlement with Assad. But for as long as Assad is in power, he's not part of the solution. He continues to be part of the problem. Whether it's through Russia, through Iran, God forbid, or the, 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 the backing from the Europeans and the U.S., Assad needs to step down. He needs to move aside. He can't be the force that holds the country together because he is now the cause that continues to divide this important country in the region. There are U.S. national interests involved because there are U.S. regional interests involved. Syria is not just Syria, which is a country contained. It shares borders with Jordan, with Israel, with Iraq, with, with Turkey. These are important allies. And the conflict in Syria is already spilling out into Lebanon, into Iraq, yeah. into Jordan. 200,000 yeah. plus why refugees you, inside okay, Turkey. Flint, but we've already seen that. Matthew, we've seen that Turkey and Israel becoming, have addressed these issues. We need, we need more, more violence. More we just need more violence. Matthew, go ahead, jump in. You, no, 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 my, you my point that, is, is that Matthew, Israel and Turkey go ahead. have both Ma already demonstrated Matthew, that ahead. they are willing to address the spillover from the conflict. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all, all I wanted to say was uh, that it seems that you know uh, Turkey and Israel have both demonstrated that they are willing and able to deal with the spillover of the conflict. I still fail to recognize why uh, U.S. interests are directly affected. Obviously, our allies might have you know issues with the spillover, but they seem perfectly capable of addressing it themselves so far. Flint, go ahead. Not yeah, I, I think it's really, really important, important to, to, to get the, 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 the U.S. perspective straight. I mean, the U.S. started supporting the opposition in Syria because the Obama administration calculated it was a way of pushing back against Iran and that Assad's overthrow might even, in their calculations, spark the overthrow of the Islamic Republic. This was detached from reality, but it was an important part of the calculation in, in 2011 going into 2012. Then the administration begins to get spooked because of, let's call it, the Benghazi effect. I mean, mm -hmm. the reality is the U.S. ambassador in Libya was almost certainly killed by groups that either the U.S. had armed and supported or that U.S. allies had, had armed and supported. So before an election, you don't want that kind of blowback. The administration backs away from Syria a bit. Now they're stepping back in because they think somehow they're going to be able to stage manage the balance of power between, you know, jihadi right. and quote-unquote more I'm moderate elements in the opposition. Fascinating discussion. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests today in New York and in Washington. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules.